So we're in Brighton, it's raining, seagulls everywhere. I'm here with my mum. First time in Brighton, huh? Yeah, first time. And it's so beautiful. <laughs> look at the seagulls and look, this building looks uh, Gurdwara. And that building looks like a mosque. Yeah, that's the Royal Pavilion, which is a inspired, very Indian-inspired building. Sadly, we're not going in there today, but we're oh. going in the uh, Brighton Museum and Art Gallery, which yes. also has a lot of, like temple looking design yeah, yeah. so you'll feel right at home yeah, i'm so excited we're just both happy to be out of the house aren't we i'm very happy and there are so many reasons behind it number one you are always too busy and uh, i'm going to spend the day with you this is the biggest thing the second thing is you know that i'm an art lover so you know this exhibition uh, is very exciting thing for me and uh, yeah the the sa site and the you know the seagulls and the interesting things around me are making me more happy so please take care of me if i get faint then you look after why would me you, why would you faint because yeah, there are so many things at the same time you, so look after me wow, you're really overwhelmed with happiness <laughs> i'm so glad you're glad to be here mom oh yeah thank you very much yeah. <laughs> hi i'm moan rizwan i'm his mom shanaz rizwan and this is meet, meet me, me at, at the, the museum. museum that's great we should say more things in unison Hi, we have an art pass. That, that's great. You can get in for free. It's just through the doors to your left. Perfect. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I'm an actor, writer, comedian, and I am here at Brighton Museum and Art Gallery today, and I've decided to bring my mum. Hi, I'm Shanaz Rizwan, poet, author, and actor. <laughs> <laughs> an all-round superstar. <laughs> Art has always been a big part of our relationship, whether we've known it or not. And for me, growing up, there was, you know, we were an immigrant family. There wasn't a lot of money. And art was like the escapism for us. It's reminding me the first visit, our first visit to a museum. Do you remember that Bethnal Green Museum of Childhood? Yeah, I do remember. Yeah. Yeah. And that was part of your college assignment. Yes. And what you used to do was you used to turn those assignments into family days out. So it was quite good, uh, you know, opportunity to spend time with my children. They were enjoying. At the same time, they were learning. And I was enjoying uh, the projects and uh, I was learning and uh, earning as well. But it was quite revolutionary as well, right? Because yes. a lot of the immigrant community where we grew up, there wasn't a lot of um, access to art. And that was something that people did not prioritize at all. Yeah. But and so even though it was a hobby, you were exactly, always really yeah. encouraging. I was, I was always into performing art and fine arts. And I wanted to uh, use that talent. And it was quite good. The stakes were high as well. So I'm surprised you allowed that to happen because actually, you know, there was a fear of us being deported back to Pakistan. Exactly. We didn't have a status in the country. No. Stakes were high. You, I remember how strict you were about us getting an education because you were like, at any point, we, would we might have to go back. Exactly. You better get exactly. A-stars or, or yeah. nothing. <laughs> it's true. And, and amongst that, even amongst that strict... We, I remember coming home from school and doing two hours of English maths and science tuition. And I remember home was more school than school. Yeah. School was a break for us. Horrible, mum. It was horrible for you, but for me, it really worked. You got very, you know, very good grades, A star and A's in your GCSEs and A level. So the outcome was quite good. No. You, you shouldn't still, be ungrateful, my one. I despise how hard you made us you, work you're, you're being and all ungrateful. the opportunities you opened up for us. How dare you? Come on. But as a kid, it was horrible. It was horrible. You are being ungrateful. But, you know, even amongst all that high pressure, you found time to, like, make us have artistic projects and yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. So when I thought of coming to the museum, you were the first person I thought yeah, of. But also it's, yeah. it's significant, this museum, because we're in Brighton and Brighton has a really big LGBTQ scene and some of the collections we're going to see today are centred around that theme. And I think we've been on a very interesting journey. I came out to you maybe five, six years ago. Yeah. And we've learned a lot about each other. Yeah, exactly. True. On that journey. Yeah. So today might spark some interesting conversations around that. Yeah. All right, Mum, so we're entering the Queer Looks yeah. collection mm -hmm. at the moment. I see. And we're going to meet the curator. 
His name is Martin, and here he is. Hi, yeah. Martin. Hi. I'm, I'm Martin. Martin. Hi, yeah. good, to, nice meet to, meet good to meet you. I'm Shanaz. Hi, lovely to meet you. Nice to meet you. And you, yeah. So you're you're the curator. I'm curator of fashion and textiles here at uh, Royal Pavilion Museums, Brighton. Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah. Um, and you're going to show us around because this is the first time I've ever taken my mum to a, a queer exhibition. Okay. So no pressure, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah. So this is a queer looks exhibition. It's a display of uh, to what it tries to do is look up the last 50 years of LGBTQ history in the UK, but also very much based about around Sussex, because Brighton is known as the gay capital, of the unofficial gay capital of Britain. So we had all these stories on our doorstep, so we really wanted to go and collect those stories for posterity. So Queer Looks um, is a collecting project, and all these those stories are told through people's outfits. So when you come in, you've got, you've got a big... Uh, central case and there's three outfits in there and there's one there's a guy called Adrian and he's in a Westwood outfit Vivian Westwood from the 80s this is what he used to wear clubbing very in the blue. 80s it's very blue well you've hit it on the head so, mm-hmm. so actually someone didn't get this but um so he's very blue and then next to him you've got someone called Ellie and she's very pink mm. yeah. those obvious sort of indicators we use to um construct you know boy girl identities from a really young age yeah. and then we've got Fox who is non-binary um, activist and on their jacket um, it says gender roles are dead so you're saying he's very blue very pink but actually all this is irrelevant so it's yeah. a way that we construct mm. identities and we we all, we all do it obviously yeah. Yeah. did you dress me in blue or pink or no n- not really you actually <laughs> would buy me pink clothes sometimes because you, and, and you didn't have a yeah. construction of that right yeah, in pakistan exactly. is not in a, pakistan yeah like, there is the no yeah for genders. no there is no concept of that and uh, I um, bought one orange outfit as well. A cowboy which, outfit. Yeah, yeah. Which well, like well, that's my favourite outfit. My yeah. orange yeah. cowboy. <gasps> that's really nostalgic. Yeah. yeah. Just bringing it back to you. But um, I remember wearing something. Maybe you bu- you bought me a pink shirt or something, <laughs> a t-shirt, and I wore it to school on uniform day, and everyone everyone took the mick. And I was at, I came home and told you I was like, Mum, you know, I was teaching you. I was like this is not cool and this is it was so funny like I was actually doing it to my mum I was learning these gender binaries no but you know you should appreciate that I have changed that concept Mm. because no 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 these days pink is in fashion for men Mum, you they, were ahead of the curve. Well, it's only quite recently in fashion history that pink became very yeah. much associated with feminine and blue with boys. So it's actually yeah. only in the last sort of 100 years or so. Yeah. But, I mean, yeah. you're, you, the way you talk about clothes, I mean, you said, just said that cowboy outfit, you know, oh, my God, it's taking me back, I love it. But that is absolutely the power of clothes and the power of dresses that, you know, these are things that are really, really personal to us. You know, you didn't make that choice. Maybe you did make that choice about the cowboy outfit. Right. Oh, 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 yeah, I yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you knew what you wanted. Um, yeah, exactly. And his, uh, clothing is incredibly powerful, which is why we wanted to collect, uh, yeah. you know, around 20 outfits that we can keep. So, I mean, this is just the sort of first flowering, but we want this to be an ongoing project. So we carry on collecting those histories because LGBTQ history has changed radically over the la- even the last 10 years. You know, we didn't really talk about non-binary um, 10 years ago, but all oh, that's completely changed. Yeah. So everything's yeah. changing all the time. Okay, so what about this outfit? This is like a blue camouflage yeah. zip skirt at the bottom, but then yeah. a harness? A harness at the top, yeah. yeah. So it's just sort of... There are trousers to go with it, so you can, uh, you know, you can either wear the skirt or you can wear trousers. This, ah. this is someone's <laughs> called Jason, Jason Snelling. And even though, I mean, most people, or lots of people in this show came from London, uh, you know, grew up in London or went clubbing in London... Um, it, Brighton attracts uh, a big LGBT community, so they tend to come down here. So this is Jason's clubbing outfit from the 90s. So there was a club in Brixton called The Fridge, um, and there was a, a, a night called on Saturday called Love Muscle. <laughs> so he used to go to Love Muscle in this outfit, and he used to say, when he was walking along the street, the cars used to stop and stuff like that. So, um, and he's given us another outfit, actually. It's all in pink velour. So, uh, you know, you can't... If you saw this person, you would know they were definitely LGBTQ. And that's the thing with clothing, you know. it's People want to be noticed in the sense that they want to be visible in society. And sometimes you have to make very extreme examples or extreme statements. Sometimes it's much more subtle. Certainly in history, it was subtler. And that, the harness is very, you know, t- yeah. tied to the LGBT community, right? It is completely, Where yeah. does it come from? Because um, I've got a harness, and I don't know yeah. why. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, do you know what? I, don't I went. I went to a know. night where I, I bought it and and I wore it. It felt really great. But I heard it was actually it's actually to something to do with like tying up. Like I it's a sexual that thing. Probably, yeah, I think it probably is a sexual thing. Well, I've totally appropriated that. <laughs> <laughs> well, there we've got here. Here we've got this is this is someone's outfit. This is a leather outfit. And these, I mean, museums are where we collect stuff that is there for generations and generations. And we're collecting this stuff now so that we don't lose it. One of the things from this project, or a couple of things from this project, actually, one, how important the older generation of LGBTQ people are for our history today. You know, if it wasn't for those people, not Jason, but also we've got James at the end, you know, who was out in London strutting his stuff in, you know, outre outfits, making a statement and saying, I am out there, I am gay, I do exist. Mm. It was those people that actually allowed us and allowed everyone in Brighton to be stomping around Brighton looking fabulous and not getting their heads kicked in. You know, so we sort of tend to forget, we tend to dismiss the older generation because it's all about being young. But actually, when I was doing this project, I realised actually how significant and how grateful I am for those older LGBTQ people that made my life and your life now, today, so much easier. Yeah, I've had this in the last few years, actually, like a real appreciation for queer ancestors. Because yeah. uh, queer stories are always the first to get killed off. Yeah. You know, And I, I had this conversation with you, Mum, because I was like, yeah. I really... Do, were there any family members you know because statistically there must have been you know did you know anyone in our massive family in Pakistan and or you know you the, the generation previous to yours like you don't hear those stories you might hear of the wayward uncle who yeah. left the family or like you yeah. know someone who went the auntie who went to live with a female friend or whatever but <laughs> because yeah. there's so much shame yeah maybe it feels like clothes are a really good way to preserve some of those stories but you know in our culture they hide, they are scared mm-hmm. uh, to be exposed. Yeah. So that is why they, they hide and they, they, they keep on suffering in silence, but they don't share. They don't share. No. We no. don't talk. We, we, we didn't talk about these things growing up. No. It just wasn't the thing, you know, there's just certain taboos you don't go near. You you know that I have accepted uh, from the core of my heart uh, when you said to me that I'm gay. So I want to explore more things which could be very helpful for us to improve uh, our relationship and uh, understanding. When I decided to tell you those things, whether that was about my sexuality, about me drinking alcohol having tasted bacon, which was actually the, the straw that broke the camel's back because you <laughs> you cried when I told you about the bacon thing, but you were fine with all the alcohol and drugs. It was very interesting uh, hierarchy of shock value there. But um, yeah, you know, it's been... I, I, I made a decision that I was going to be honest with you because I think we come from a long line of, and a lot of people do come from a long line of lies and their parents don't know who they are and their parents don't know who they are. And I didn't, I didn't want anyone, anyone in the family dying, not knowing the true essence of uh, each other. So I want you to know who I am. And then I I felt like it was quite hard for you to process. And we went through our own battles, but then you really rose to the occasion because you were like, well, if you're telling me these things about you, I guess I better tell you about me. And then you told me a bunch of stuff that shocked me even more than I shocked you (laughs) about, you know, your childhood in Pakistan and some of the stuff around your gender identity that was confusing for you growing up and a relationship you had. And I was so, uh, blown away by how honest you were being as well we'll go into more of that later i'm sure uh, yeah. the exhibition will spark yeah. some of that conversation yeah. yeah you know when you told me um that you are gay i was shocked but after a few minutes i thought that how bold you are and i really really appreciate i'm learning from you that how can we accept the truth you never ever hide the things from me, you tell everything, you are very truthful. And it's very difficult to be so truthful in the world. But but I'm learning from you and yeah, now I'm quite happy and satisfied that if you are a gay, you are a gay. I don't, I know or I don't know. <laughs> and I'm very happy and satisfied that, yeah, we understand each other and we are happy. I'm glad to, but can you please drop the A when you say gay? Because when you say a gay, it makes me sound like a specimen. Oh, <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry for that. No, it's all right. You're, and it's great. We're both learning. And, you, you know, you're, you're, you're an ally of the LGBTQ plus community now. Do you know what LGBT stands for? Yes. Go on. 
lesbian yeah gay yeah not i gay no okay no 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 gay lesbian yeah. gay and um something transgender <laughs> God, what did you miss the b oh you missed out bisexual oh bisexual yeah. okay yes now i know yeah and then q queer yeah and then plus all the other letters are covered so you're safe when you say plus all right okay yeah. thank I, you oh, i always say the plus so thank that... you teacher <laughs> Look at that uh, white shalwar kameez and uh, black embroidered vest. It's very traditional uh, Pakistani out- outfit. Yeah, what, what has, how comes that in the exhibition? That, that's some guy called John Jill. And yeah. um, he, he was at university and he was from middle class background and he was sort of in the, this was in the 50s, early 60s. And he was very much doing what his family expected him to do. went to university and blah 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 and then he escaped uh, went traveled around Pakistan Afghanistan and he had these clothes made for him and for the, the these clothes represent for John that shedding of the old self that person that his parents expected him to be and that him embracing his identity as a gay man so here for him again i mean these are these are kept from night the early 60s and he's kept his passport he's kept a travel log everything so um for him going away to these countries represented a massive break and a new personality for him. I mean that's really fascinating because I I wore a shawl kameez every year on Eid I'd wear it to yeah. the mosque. So for me it's affiliated with something that was so separate from my queer identity and yeah. that could never merge. Well, uh, and it's a sign of like now I wear it and I wear it at like a, a queer night or a friend's birthday do. or whatever. Yeah, yeah and like and change bits of it. Right. to to as a way of um it's therapeutic for me to tie my different identities right. together right through yeah. clothes yeah so it's just, it's fascinating that someone can have such a different experience with a set of clothes yeah what and what about what about fashion mum if you had to pick one outfit from here that you could wear what would it be not the harness apart from the harness so it's obvious <laughs> you wear that. I, I, definitely i won't that, that. so <laughs> if i say that i will select this one that my one would believe it my one <laughs> So is it PVC would you say? Uh, a PVC uh black bra, black bra and panties? Knickers. Yeah, quite oh. high waisted knickers with fishnets and high heel shoes. Wow, mum. And then it's no. got a little uh, sort of I was you, joking. You've though. outdone yourself. With, yeah. No, no, no. I I was joking. Um, <laughs> no, no, come come to but this. But were one. you really? No, no, no. Come to this one. Oh, Alfie Aldenbury, the I blue would, sequin. I would select this one. Turquoise color. and you know but i will remove the bow and um, i will make the bottom longer yeah so i will just um, increase the length of that and the right. hair and so that outfit if you could completely change it is what yeah. you're saying yeah, exactly. <laughs> so this is an outfit this is worn by someone called Alfie Ordinary um and he's a performer he does a show called help i think i'm fabulous <laughs> and he's just won loads of awards he's brilliant and um I did sort of have slight reservations. I I thought about these these outfits because next to him is his partner called Lydia Lescabies. Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, this the, the Lydia is wearing this is like a per una undergarment from Marks and Spencers, is yeah. it? Skin and then tight, he's, skin colored. Skin tight, yeah. And then he's just thrown all blood over it. Yeah, but then the blood sequins. has red sequins on it. Yeah, so he's glammed it all up, you know. Yeah. And then he's got a huge wig. zombie. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um but I was I had slight reservations or I really did think about um in what ways does is drag representative of LGBTQ dress because I didn't want it to be too performative to per- performative you know I wanted it to be clothes that people wore but then when I mean you go back in history to the 18th century and there were spaces safe spaces for queer people to go to and they would dress up they would wear mm. women's clothes and it was somewhere that they could construct those identities express those identities safely and then they'd go home or do whatever so these safe spaces with these public sort of yeah. but private spaces were have been throughout our history and so i didn't mind the also the performative aspect is i think is really important to incorporate because a lot of you could argue that someone wearing their office shirt is more performative than when they yeah. do drag yeah, like absolutely. that's more Completely. of a lie than yeah. they wig yeah you know? completely it looks that this lady was shot by a revolver which was loaded with the bullet and the sequences <laughs> <laughs> she was yeah. killed by glamour 
<laughs> Spot on, man. I like your take on that. Great. You should, you should be a curator. <laughs> Mum, didn't you spend the majority of your childhood in boys' clothes? Yes, I did, yeah. Yeah. I used to be a child star, you know, I played yeah. the boys' roles. Right. So, yeah, my... Okay, this, my should, should I set the context? You say it like it's such a normal thing. <laughs> I used to be a child star, yeah, yeah. So, basically, my mum, right, her dad used to work in a film studio uh, selling film reels, and one day they needed a child actor, a boy, and the director was like, I need a, a, an actor in two hours. And so her dad went home. You must have been three years old or something? Two and a half. Two and a half. And he shaved her hair, <laughs> put on some boys' clothes. So she started working in uh, in films. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and she was such as a, a big boy, hit. Did you continue as a boy? Yeah, because no one yeah. knew she was a girl. Yeah, no, no one knew. Um, so yeah, I continued that uh, till I was ten. How many films wow. did you do? Thirty-five. I, I performed in thirty-five films, and for ten years I was on stage, radio, television, and film. And as a boy, as a boy, and I received my first child star award at the age of six. Basically, <gasps> guys, she was the Macaulay Culkin of Karachi. <laughs> <laughs> you were but nailing how did, it. How did you feel about that? Did you did it sort of mess with your head, thinking I'm I'm a girl? Or no, no, no. At that time, you know, I was too young and Mm. gradually I accepted and I really feel that I'm a boy and it was very difficult for me when I started wearing um, you know the outfits of female and uh, it was yeah yeah. uh, it was not acceptable for me and I felt very weird I wanted to continue to wear uh, boys outfits but my grandmother and my mom uh, they didn't allow me so it was quite hard for me (laughs) your dad did a good job (laughs) <laughs> yeah Yeah. thanks a lot for your time Martin it's been really nice to have that insight into such a diverse bunch of clothes yeah. that yeah. would otherwise yeah. some of them would seem quite ordinary but they've got all, these hist- all yeah, this history no. yeah, yeah thank you no it's been yeah. a pleasure well, I'm, 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 well I hope you enjoyed it I'm glad you've enjoyed yeah, we it we did so. yeah thank Great. you very much Martin it's lovely thank to hear you. your stories as well thank, thank you, you. <laughs> What did you think of Queer Looks, Mum? It's very nice, very interesting. It reminded me of my childhood as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. fascinating. And you know, I didn't realise when we were coming here, I thought that uh, this exhibition and this museum um, it relates to you, but it is relevant to me as well. It oh, that's really deep. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true, it's true, really. Yeah. yeah. There's so many things that you, you just, you know, you, we don't think about. I think that's, what muse- that's why I like museums, because they bring out the unconscious... And exactly. show you the significance of some of the stories you might have forgotten. Yes. So, Mum, we're now in the Museum of Transology. Mm-hmm. And what you're going to see here is a collection of items and stories from people from the transgender community. You know, yeah. we talked about LGBT. Yeah. Well, this is the T. Mm. There are some, I can see the, some medicines and injections. Well, let's have a look. Yeah. Yeah, so we've got like a cupboard full of medicine boxes yeah. and then there's a tag on each one and I think that's the, a message from the person who owned it um, used Prognova packet the medication that has finally allowed me in part to look like myself after 40 years wow oh. Oh. and there's a different shelf with a medicine packet on it and a, a, a packaging box that it came in mm. Hey guys, this was my first ever vial of sustenance, kind of. My nurse refused to use it as she didn't trust my source. The 48-hour delay for my tea shot felt like 48 years. However, eight months later, I've never been happier. Parker Myers. Do, do, do you get it, man? No, I so, couldn't understand. So these, these are the, I think, transitioning meds that facilitate the necessary biological changes in your body to transition mm-hmm. from one gender to another. Yeah, okay. It's, it's funny, isn't it? Because when you see it in a c- cupboard like this, yeah. it's sort of, it's isolating just one part of many things that are going on. And I reckon, obviously, th- these items had a massive significance because that's something on a daily basis, you know, mm. you're, you're doing. So, so Mum... Yeah. Over here, we've got photographs of people, uh, transgender people, and um, they're being projected onto a wall. Yeah. 
Above the pictures, there is a quote. Uh, it says that it's important that spaces created by and for trans people exist. A place where we can share our art, words, and authentic selves. Wow. So this looks like um, they're screening short films and there's some headphones there. Do you want to have a listen, Mum? There you go. Thank you. Good fun. It's simply a question of we want you to understand. So, that so the film that's on right now is telling the story of a trans woman called Fran. And uh, there's a few different stories to hear uh, and they're all shot by a trans filmmaker called Fox Fisher for the project My Generation and the Trans Aging and Care Project. Since I've made the decision that I'm not going back, I feel better in myself, even though I'm sure other people won't be too happy about it. But I'm afraid I've reached a point where other people have to accommodate me rather than me accommodating them. I don't want to get reach the end of my life never having been myself. I don't know how many years I've got left, and I certainly intend for them to be lived for me by me, ask me. Hi AJ. Hi AJ. Hi, welcome Hi. to the Museum of Transology, hello. Hi, I'm AJ Scott and I am the curator of the Museum of Transology, but I'm also the collector of it. Uh, I started the collection about five years ago. I am both a museum professional, trained and you know working in the sector, but I am also trans. There's very few of us in the industry. For me, it was a chance to navigate the difficulty of being an outside community that's underrepresented within the museum world and to help that process to try and get trans voices into the museum. And in my mind, if you don't see yourself on the walls of a museum, you're made historically homeless. You're told that your life is, is not worth remembering and that you're destined to be forgotten. And this is a process of othering because by excluding people from the museum, the people who go to the museum don't think you're worth being there. It also means that trans people won't come to the museum because why would they? So it was really important to me when we see this huge shift I think it's the most significant shift in gender politics that we've seen in the UK since the 1970s. This is about the fight for equal rights for all people, regardless of their gender. So it was very important to me that we built a collection that A, gave voice to the trans community, but that B, meant that this moment in time wouldn't be lost again, because it's very difficult to locate trans lives retrospectively. They become invisible. So it's now a collection of... 250 odd objects it's the biggest collection of material culture surrounding trans lives in the world um, there's over 100 120 over 120 people represented in the collection so far and then on top of that there's the opportunity for people who visit the op the exhibition to contribute their own tag that are attached to the everyday objects um, that have been donated to the collection so that their voice is included in the collection as well about their own gender experiences and that broadens out this inquiry into gender and makes the exhibition for everyone about everyone the objects are everyday objects for the most part, but extraordinary in their ordinariness. It's a varied and complex collection. Yeah. So should we start with uh, the ones that you think are most powerful? Yeah, let me take you and show you some of my favourite things. Okay. If we go over here, each of the cabinets in the collection has a theme. The objects talk to each other and they share some of the similarities in the stories. But as well, there's things that are just everyday objects. Um, and this one in particular, this lipstick, I'll read it out to you. It says, this lipstick was from my wonderful sister, who was the first family member to accept and support my transition. Oh, so sweet. Yeah, so we're looking at a, a thing that looks like a bathroom cabinet it's on, on a tiled wall with a, a bunch of objects. Is, is that a lace front hair piece? Yep, that's a hair piece. There's deodorant, there's lipsticks, there's nail polishes. Basically, they're personal ephemera beauty products uh, that all relate to sort of the private realm, if you like. Yeah. 
So, for example, there's a Lynx, a can of Lynx deodorant up there from a young guy that said it was the first boy product that he used and how he, it made him feel great and he walked through the door feeling strong and he's drawn a little strong arm at the end of it. <laughs> and I think it's actually quite significant because... You know, it just it just goes to show that all young boys think Lynx smells good, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I'm looking at a cabinet now with two jars and what looks like breasts inside yeah. them. So this collection here is everything I saved from the hospital, from my surgery. And I also managed to actually save my breast tissue as well. I was like, actually, this is my body. It's a real material marker. Museums have a history of collecting human remains. Where else can you put it? but in a museum. Um, there's been, for the very most part, a fascination with them, but a fascination that is not a spectacularization. People want to know about it, and you can see that very deliberately there's a section of paperwork that surrounds it that unpacks the process mm -hmm. of going through this NHS journey. And on the wall next to it here, you can see another eight contributors have also contributed the same documentation to match my own, and they all did that independently. So they too all wanted to talk about their experience dealing with the medical system here. Now, I know a lot, a lot of uh, people have said publicly uh, when they get asked about such private matters, it can be reductive. You know, people are just so obsessed with the story about the genitals. Do you find that this combats that and allows a space where that can still be discussed without it becoming the main narrative? I think that's one of the things about museums. I think that's one of the essential experiences of a museum is that they become safe spaces to talk, to debate, to learn. These items have been put on display by me with my consent and I was motivated to do it. It wasn't someone intruding on my life mm. and asking me about what genitalia I had, right? Mm. This was, this was self-motivated and self... And so I have done all of this. It, the power is in my court and I have now opened up a space that allows people to learn, right? And learn from the object out. This is a space of learning and discussion. That's what museums should do. So that was our day at the museum. Mum, what did you think? It was really, really interesting, amazing and uh, very knowledgeable. I really enjoyed. Really, I was thinking that this museum will give me more knowledge and confidence for things which are related to you. But now I realise that uh, there were many things uh, which were directly re relevant to me as well. I feel like you have been a gender-bending person all your life and you... <laughs> transcended a lot of those limiting yes. binaries. What about the Museum of Transology? Because that world is very new to you, right? Yeah, I appreciate uh, the people who are uh, contributing to make uh, this exhibition successful. For example, the people who donated the items and the people who are uh, representing them and telling us the stories behind it. And uh, I would like to congratulate them and um, yeah, thank you. Because there's a lot of misinformation out there about trans, about the trans community, I think. And I think when you come into a space like this and you know it's been created by trans people, it allows us to have a, a deeper understanding and human connection with some of these stories. Because some of the items are very everyday, you yeah, know, like exactly. a lipstick or... Yeah, yeah. So I think that um, the team of this um, exhibition are helping LGBT. Can so say the QI plus as well? LGBTQ plus. Q I Q I plus plus okay I think that they are helping LGBTQI plus um, wow you did it <laughs> you remembered all the letters uh, yes I'm learning I'm Mom, learning I'm so thank proud you, of you, you know. thank you very much Mohan uh, credit goes to you I've been Moa Rizwan. Thanks for listening to me and my mum, Shehnaz, at the Brighton Museum and Art Gallery. If you like this episode of the podcast, please rate it, subscribe, or tell a friend. Don't forget, if you've got an art pass, you can get free entry or discounts on museums all around the country. Thanks for listening and goodbye. Bye.